My name is Christina Hendricks and I teach philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC, Canada. In this video, I'm going to give you some of the historical and political background for Plato and Socrates to help you better understand Plato's dialogues. This is video one of two videos, so uh, be sure to catch the second one as well. Socrates was a philosopher who, so far as we know, went around Athens engaging people in philosophical conversations. Young men of Athens would follow him around and learn how to have philosophical discussions themselves. There are no records of Socrates having written anything down, only that he talked with people in person. Plato appears to have been one of those people who, in his youth, uh, followed Socrates. Later, Plato started a philosophical school and also wrote numerous philosophical texts. Many of these are dialogues, fictional conversations between characters. Most of Plato's dialogues feature Socrates as one of the characters speaking. To get a better sense of what is going on in these dialogues, we need to know a bit of the political history of Athens at the time of Socrates and Plato. Athens at the time was a direct democracy, which means that everyone who was a citizen could vote in the assembly. But not every adult was a citizen. Only those who were male, over the age of 20, and had Athenian parents. No women, foreigners, children, or slaves could vote, so I've crossed them out in this picture. The image at the bottom shows the area of Athens where the assembly of citizens would meet. There were about 40 such meetings per year at the time that Socrates and Plato lived. There would be about 5,000 to 6,000 people at a time at the assembly. Citizens got money to attend, which was a way to try to get the vo voices of people who didn't have a lot of money, as well as the voices of the rich. Anyone who wished to speak would go up onto the speaker's rock, shown in the top image, to address the crowd. This rock is on the right in the bottom image. As you can imagine, one had to learn how to speak loudly and also persuasively to get many people to vote for your proposals. The assembly's job was to vote on laws and other proposals, which were put forward by a group called the Council of 500. The Council of 500 was a group of people who were chosen by lottery out of 10 different areas of Athens to ensure geographical representation. You did have to fulfill some criteria to be eligible, though. You had to be older than 30, pay taxes, and have a good moral reputation. The council prepared proposals for the assembly to vote on, and they served for one year. Ten people on the council served as presidents for part of the year, and then another ten for another part of the year, and so on. The presidents set the agendas for the meetings of the council. There was one person per day who was the chairman of the presidents for the day. The order was chosen by lottery. This person would take care of day-to-day -day issues, greet foreign visitors, hold the keys to the treasury. But then the next day it would be someone else, and so on. You should be getting the sense that Athens valued equality. They shared power amongst many citizens, choosing people even just by lottery. At this time in Athens, it was important to learn how to speak well in front of large groups of people. In addition to the assembly, if you went to court, you had to argue your own case. There were no lawyers to do that for you. So wealthy families would hire traveling teachers called sophists who would teach young men how to persuade others with speeches. The sophists had a reputation for not being concerned so much with persuading others to get the truth, but rather to get what you want for yourself, to win in the assembly and the law courts. They were known for teaching people how to make bad arguments sound good in order to persuade others and win debates. This point is referenced in Plato's text called Apology, in which Socrates says people think this is what he does. Many sophists were relativists. They didn't believe there was any objective truth or moral goodness. What is true or false, morally right or wrong, they thought, didn't exist objectively. It just depended on what a group of people said these were. Sometimes groups agree on some things being morally right, but not others. Thus, groups one and two in the image have a bit of a crossover. Plato disagreed. Plato was an ethical objectivist. He thought that what was morally right was so for all people at all times and places. And thus, in this image, uh, group two has the objective truth about morality. We can see Plato's moral objectivism in the dialogue called Euthyphro, which depicts Socrates speaking to a priest about the nature of piety. Socrates is looking for a single definition of piety that is universally valid, and Euthyphro tries, but is unable to come up with one. 
That doesn't mean, though, that Plato thinks there is no universally valid definition of piety. This dialogue depicts Socrates searching for it and only shows that Euthyphro the priest doesn't have it, even though he claims to do so, a theme we will revisit again in Plato's text called Apology.